Almighty God, graciously behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and delivered into the hands of sinful men to suffer death upon the cross. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing the old rugged cross.
Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who may have and under. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. And I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Our Lord Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross for our sins and transgressions. In a symbolic gesture, please come forward and take one of these spikes and put it in the cross as we contemplate the sins that sent Jesus to the cross for us. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Reading from the book of Hebrews. 
Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we have not a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard for his godly fear. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Please remain seating as we sing in 550, Lamb of God.
This is the next promised treasure for us to share today. The altar is stripped, the chancel is empty. Everything is a simple and stark reminder that God's own son, Jesus Christ, has died. What better reminder of his death for you is there today than this rough wooden cross. The cruel instrument of death, this cross that was used by the Roman Empire to terrorize the people of the nations that they had conquered. It vividly reveals the Father's heartfelt love for the world because he did not spare his one and only Son from this death as your substitute. In the book of Genesis, Abraham was spared from having to sacrifice his own son Isaac when God provided a ram in the thicket to be sacrificed. Now our Heavenly Father sends his own perfect, unblemished ram, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ our Lord, who takes away the sin of the world by willingly dying in our place. In the 19th century, John Bowring wrote the words to the hymn that we know as In the Cross of Christ I Glory. And the first verse reads, In the cross of Christ I glory, towering over the wrecks of time, all the light of sacred story gathers round its head sublime. The physical element of wood that our Lord hangs on to save us has a biblical history all by itself. In fact, wood is often the substance used in the Old Testament to rescue or to sweeten or to raise things up in the Bible. For example, in the book of Genesis, God placed two large wooden figures in the Garden of Eden. There was the tree of life, and then there was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. At first, the tree of life was a sign of promise. The other, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, was a test of faithfulness for Adam and Eve. A little bit later in the book of Genesis, in a sign for Noah, God directed him to gather gopher wood to build the ark that would safely hold his family above the waters as the rest of the world drowned. And then after Moses led Israel out of Egypt and across the Red Sea, the Lord had him throw a piece of wood into the bitter waters of Merah in order to sweeten them for Israel to drink. Much later on in the history of Israel, Elisha the prophet prophetically threw a wooden stick into the Jordan River, raising up a fallen axe head, foreshadowing the power of God to save the lost from the depths of sin. Now, while none of these wood stories directly points to the cross upon which Jesus died, they do indirectly reveal what the role of the cross is in saving you. Because the Holy Spirit, who is the author of Scripture through the inspiration of its writers, excels at doing things like that. Which means our task then as people of faith is to see the picturesque way that they connect to the story of salvation. So let's first reflect on the story of Noah and the flood. God could have chosen any number of to destroy the world and save Noah and his family. But he didn't. Instead, God chose a wooden boat to keep Noah, his family, and all the animals safe. God used the wood to rescue them and enable them to float above the water. Martin Luther took this to be a precursor. This indicated to him the church of God that is the holy ark that keeps the family of the baptized safe from all the sin and eternal death that swirls around us. So on this Good Friday, ask yourself, what troubles are flooding your mind? Are you overwhelmed with trouble from so many different things that you feel like you're drowning sometimes? Perhaps it's fractures in your family or relationship failures or misunderstandings, frustrations.
frustrations at work, or even having no work and finding no purpose at all. In such troubled waters, the wood of Christ's cross promises to keep you afloat, to rescue you, and carry you through all the trials of life. Jesus was willingly flooded with the weight and guilt of this world's sin, so much so that he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet by his submergence into the evils of this world, he, the righteous and sinless son, conquered sin, death, and hell itself. Moving on a little bit further, why did Moses throw a piece of wood into those bitter waters at Merah? It was to sweeten it so that the Israelites could drink it and live. Bad water, like water contaminated with iron or sulfur or just plain dirty polluted water, almost chokes you and you can't get it down. Well, God could have done a number of things. He could have had Moses pray over the bitter waters. He could even have, have, have had him shout the divine command. But no, the Lord told Moses that he would make those bitter waters drinkable and sweet. By the means of this piece of wood thrown into them, God works in mysterious ways. So we ask ourselves, are there some bitter pills that we swallow in our lives? Do feelings of bitterness linger in your heart or soul against people? Are you justly upset because you have been wronged or betrayed somewhere? Even amidst your bitterness and restlessness, God comes to sweeten and gladden your waters of life. So you may once again open your hand to others with an unclenched fist. In the Bible, Joseph forgave his brothers who betrayed him and sold him into slavery. And Jesus bore all of the betrayal and bitterness from Judas, from Peter, from all the disciples who fled from him. Similarly, the wooden cross can sweeten bitterness and can soften anger. Jesus was betrayed, and his naked body was nailed to a tree so that sin and all the bitterness and anger that it breeds might be done forever. Let's consider Elisha and how God floated a heavy iron axe head with a lighter piece of wood. Again, God could have done a number of things. Why didn't Elisha just speak over the waters? Why didn't he just motion his hand? Could he not, not even have parted the Jordan River with his cloak and then simply walked in and picked up that axe head? Instead, with the act of throwing that piece of wood into the water, he raised the weighted iron. And when did you last see iron float? Well, it doesn't. But the cross of Jesus uplifts you. Jesus lightens your load. He takes all your guilt, your personal shame, your worries, your troubles, all of your sin, and he nails it to himself. So the psalmist recommends to us, cast your burden on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. Although millions of things could be weighing down on you right now. Financial worries, marriage problems, problems with your children or your siblings or friends, even cancer or chronic illness. God knows them all. God cares for you. Every day brings new burdens to test you, to weigh you down like that iron axe head. But Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Your bloody Savior, Jesus Christ, invites you to cast every weight on him, so that by means of his simple wooden cross, you will be lightened, lifted up, sustained by his forgiving grace. The cross of Christ is the means by which God took action to rescue, to sweep.
sweeten and to lighten your life. And so as you behold this replica of his wooden cross, may it always remind you of the incredible love of Jesus. He gives you eternal life now. You are his forever because he shed his blood for you. And that's why today of all Fridays of the year, this is the one that we call Good Friday. Amen. Congregation, please stand. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Gracious God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you gather us together at the foot of your Son's wooden cross, that we may join with the eyewitnesses of his death and behold his all-sufficient sacrifice for our redemption. Grant that the message of the Lamb of, of God slain for our salvation brings us the riches of your present in peace. Lead us to see that our sins caused Jesus' great agony in the garden, that our sins nailed him to the cross of Calvary. And he has forsaken by his Father, so that we might never be forsaken, and that he died so that we might live. Lord Jesus, grant that on this Friday that we call good, the treasured story of your wondrous love for us may draw us closer to you. Encourage our hearts and minds as we hold fast to your word, knowing that all you accomplished upon Calvary's cloth was done for our salvation. Holy Spirit, you unite us by baptism to the death and resurrection of Jesus. Help us to know the power of sharing in his death, so that with him we may partake in his resurrection. All glory, honor, and praise be to you with the Father and the Son, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Congregation, please be seated. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to the Gospel. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you see? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you see? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken, of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas 
would advise the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest, but Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, if what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, you also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once a rooster crowed. Responsibly, the words of Isaiah. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up, and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marked beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see. And that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant. And like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him. No beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we have seen him not. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters, so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken, to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord 
Or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and he went out, bearing his own cross, to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Sing the first verse of hymn 449, O Sacred Head Now Lord.
on the salvation of the whole world. Oh, oh come, let us worship him. Behold the life-giving cross on which was hung the salvation of the whole world. Oh, come, let us worship him. was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. says the Lord, O oh my people, holy, holy Lord God, God holy, holy and mighty God, God, holy and most merciful Redeemer, God, God eternal, leave us not to the bitter death, O oh Lord, have mercy. Thus says the Lord, O oh my people, holy, holy Lord God, holy and mighty God, holy and most merciful Redeemer. God eternal, keep us steadfast in the true faith. O Lord, have mercy. Thus says the Lord, O my people. Holy Lord God, holy and mighty God, holy and most merciful Redeemer, God eternal, allow us not to lose hope in the face of death and hell. O Lord, have mercy. The soldiers had crucified Jesus. They took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. I have poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, and it is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. And my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. When they came to Jesus, 
and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth that you also may believe. For these things took place, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Isaiah wrote, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors.
please stand and let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you will that your Son should bear for us the pains of the cross, and so remove from us the power of the adversary. Help us so to remember and give thanks for our Lord's passion, that we may receive forgiveness of sin and redemption from everlasting death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.